So I propose that uh, we start. Uh, I am Philip Zarlowski, a professor at ESCP, and I am speaking here on behalf of our academic dean, Professor Leon Lelouza, uh, who unfortunately had a last minute constraint. So he's sorry he cannot uh, be with us this evening. Uh, still, he has handed over to me the notes he has prepared, uh, so I will try and read them to you uh, on his be behalf uh, to make a short introduction to uh, our conference today. So dear guests, uh, dear partners, dear colleagues, and dear students, uh, first we'd like to welcome and thank uh, our panelists, Mrs. Christine Cabot Borel, who is Executive Vice President Operations and Industrial Assets at CMA CGM. Emil Oxjeden, who is a Commercial Vice President of the Port of Rotterdam International. Stéphane Raison, who is with us online. Mr. Raison is Director General of Aropa. And Mr. Francis Valla, founding president of the French Maritime Cluster and founding president of European Network of Maritime Clusters. Uh, we would also like to welcome our partners, ESA of Beirut and the French Vietnamese School of Management, our alumni and uh, the journalists. So there are people in uh, the room on campus today and also people who are with us online. Uh, so first, a few words about the significance of uh, maritime trade. Uh, maritime trade represents 90% of world trade in volumes transported and 80% in value. Uh, more than 80% of freight traffic in France transits through seaports. Uh, Professor Lelouza reminds us that uh, when a boat blocked the Suez Canal the whole world economy shook. Um, the sea is at the crossroads of all sectors of the economy and meets the needs of humanity in terms of food, energy transition, health, minerals, transport, and leisure. Uh, alongside traditional sectors, new industrial sectors will emerge over the coming decades uh, and they must take into account the double concern for the sustainability of resources and the protection of the environment. Professor Lolouza also reminds us that, uh, that the president, French President Emmanuel Macron will open the One Ocean Summit on February the 9th in, Bre in Brest to mobilize all the main stakeholders in this sector to uh, ensure parity geographical uh, diversity and the inclusion of young people and diversity and inclusion are at the heart of uh, ESCP's mission. Uh, now the whole ESCP community is conscious of the importance of sustainability and protection of the environment thanks to the school internal policy and, uh, and also to uh, the uh, different programs that are taught in the school. So our mission is to prepare students to become responsible and conscious business leaders. And we are also happy to uh, have uh, a partnership uh, and to be, have been able to set up this operation thanks to the Marine Academy. Um, so this will lead to host the last event of the centenary of the rebirth of the Marine Academy, which will be held on the other school of the, the other campus, sorry, of the school uh, at Montparnasse on, mm, at the beginning of May. Um, and then, well, maybe when uh, you have been on the campus, it was already uh, dark, but if you look at the courtyard, uh, you can see that uh, there are anchors decorating the walls, which might come as a surprise in a business school. And in fact, it's a reminder uh, of uh, the short period when the school was home to a department of maritime navigation founded in uh, 1905 
to train future long-haul captains uh, from among the Ministry of Navy fellows. So for many years, students of the school uh, did their military service in the French Navy, and many alumni are pursuing careers in the maritime world as ship owners, line managers, consultants, insurers, consignees. And at this point, uh, Professor Leluza was supposed to uh, leave the floor to me uh, as the scientific director of the MSc in International Project Management at uh, ESCP. So it is my pleasure and honor to say a few words on introduction to the conference. Uh, as indeed the MSc is uh, probably one of the programs of the school that is the closest to the maritime sector. Uh, we, by the way, have a long-term partnership with CMA CGM. Uh, and uh, in the MSc, we are training students to better manage large-scale international projects, projects of uh, transformation in an international context, and also projects of international business development. So the supply chain, logistics, and the maritime sector are central to many of these projects. And some of our students, notably when they have a prior engineering background, may hold positions in companies in the shipping industry. So the maritime sector is meaningful uh, for uh, job opportunities for our students, but also for many industries, and is itself undergoing deep changes. We have witnessed uh, unexpected bottlenecks in shipping and sharp increases uh, in prices. At the same time, the industry is reconfiguring itself as uh, key players are implementing strategies of, of uh, vertical integration, uh, and also companies and for, uh, foreign states have taken control of major port infrastructures. So there are changes in the geopolitical context and the rise of the uh, environmental concerns that may impact the sector, notably if uh, supply chains become less global and more regional. So these changes open many opportunities for project managers at uh, both strategic level and also, also at a very operational level. So to address these topics and many others, and without further ado, uh, I will leave the floor to Mrs. Mr. Sorry, Mr. Francis Valla, uh, who will introduce the speakers and uh, moderate the conference. I would like to thank again Mr. Valla and our speakers for their participation in this event. And I would like to extend these thanks to uh, Gilles Gouteux, head of institutional events at TSCP, who has been instrumental in the organization of the uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm very glad to be here, and uh, we are thankful for your welcome. I was very happy to organize uh, with Francis or upon his uh, request and uh, with Gilles Gouteux this uh, uh, conference, also on behalf indirectly of the Academy de Marine, which is always a, a, a pleasure. I have been asked, uh, I've been said that uh, most of your students have not uh, big knowledge about uh, maritime activities, about uh, the sea, and uh, of course a few of them, but uh, generally speaking, um, they are not, uh, they have not such a knowledge, and so I was asked to introduce rather generally uh, uh, this topic. So I will ask my uh, colleagues to forgive me because I will say a few things which they know by heart and maybe better than me, but uh, this, uh, this is uh, my challenge. And then, uh, of course, uh, we shall have three, uh, also with Mr. Raison, whom I agree, uh, we shall have a, um, a good and very interesting discussion, I guess. Well, you know, uh, uh, and this is for the students, uh, uh, we always speak, uh, at least in our maritime world, about the blue planet. Right? And our planet is blue when you look at it from space, because, of course, 71% is covered by seas. And 50% of the world people live close to uh, the sea. 
but it is also blue because of the economy. We are now more and more speaking about blue and hopefully blue and green economy for future, but blue economy has been here already for a few words, for a few years. Uh, you know, at the beginning of uh, the, of, let's say in 2011 or 12, uh, the maritime activities were already the second activity in the world, just, uh, just uh, behind uh, all what is fee food and uh, agriculture, with uh, 1,500 billions of uh, euros uh, of, of production value. Uh, so it was second, very far uh, uh, before uh, uh, all what is space, uh, planes, uh, uh, telecommunications, everything of this kind. Um, now it is planned that it would represent 1,000 billion more uh, at the end of this decade. Uh, thanks to, uh, so it's uh, 1,000 billion more from, uh, sorry, yes, 1,000, but it will be 2,500. So it's 1,000 billion more, which half of which will be coming from the new maritime activities and 500, half, from the uh, traditional activities. The new activities, uh, well, uh, you, you know, it's the uh, renewable energies, marine energies, the deep sea uh, mining, uh, the biotechnics, the aquaculture, uh, chemistry, uh, all these things. And it will be the same for a country like France, for instance, which today represents about uh, 360,000 of direct employments, direct employments, and uh, 91 billion euros of turnover. And these figures should be more or less doubled at the end of this uh, decennium. And this is uh, uh, true in many, many fields. The main one, of course, you quoted it, is uh, the maritime transportation, when, when you said, which is absolutely true, of course, which is 90% of, uh, of tons of tonnage which are transported in the world are transported by sea. Uh, which is, of course, uh, absolutely huge, and they are transported by uh, roughly, you know, it depends on which basis you take, but roughly 60,000 uh, merchant ships, uh, which uh, represent a growth of 10%, uh, of 40% in the last 10 years for the worldwide fleet. So it's a lot, and it's good news in a way, because there is no uh, more... Um, uh, a ton uh, of, of cargo which is transported by ship is uh, representing, is very, uh, is more clean than any other way of transportation. I took the averages as they come from ADEM, which is a special uh, body in France uh, for this type uh, uh, of uh, environmental things from the state. Um, train would uh, have uh, twice more uh, CO2 than a sheep, a lorry would have five, five, more, five more times, until 20 more times, and a plane it would be 160 times, in average. So uh, the, the maritime transportation is a very clean tool. Why is it so, uh, why is it so uh, powerful? Why is it so important? It's very easy to understand. Some may complain about it, globalization, some may be enthusiastic about it, but the case is, the fact is that if you want to uh, transport 25 tons, 25 tons of cargo from Shanghai to Le Havre or to Rotterdam, um, it would cost about the same price as a ticket, one plane ticket for one passenger in second class. So it's a very, very low, and this is of course due to the uh, size and efficiency of the big uh, container vessels. Uh, when you buy here, you know, the world has become a village. Uh, when you buy a, a, a refrigerator uh, uh, in, in, a, in a store here, the cost from Chi which, is, which has been built in China, and of course it's part of a problem, it's part of a solution, I know that, we shall come back on it, but the cost of transportation is less than euro. It's 0.3 euro, 0.4 euro, so it's about nothing. Um, 
the cost of transportation has been divided by 50 or 60, and even in many cases, 80 since the last war. And this is a very heavy, heavy trend. Of course, we have a globalization, but it has always, it's a continuous trend. Uh, when Vasco de Gama uh, discovered the Cape of Good Hope, of Good Hope, in a few years' time, uh, Venezia, who was ruling the world, uh, the, the international commerce at that time, was destroyed and it became Lisbon, just because of the transportation by ship. The same happens for coastal trading. All the big fairs, you know, in France we had very big fairs, Foire de Champagne and so on, they were destroyed in a few years, just because ships, although one out of three was sinking in the sea, was so much more efficient than any other transportation. And then you had the Hanseatic cities, and uh, well, it has, it's a continuous thing. When we speak about fishing, today we are about consuming about 200 million tons of, uh, of uh, fishes per, per, per year, uh, out of which 50% is coming from uh, aquaculture. It's huge, and it's continuously growing which also is raising all sorts of problems. I will come back on it. The uh, telecommunications. A lot of you think probably that most of the telecommunications uh, are uh, coming or uh, are uh, made through the uh, satellites in the space. No, 99%, 99% are uh, made through uh, submarine cables. You have already about 2 million kilometers of this uh, cables. When you speak about gas or about oil, about 30%, it's plus or minus, but 30% of the worldwide reserves known, and 30% about of the production is coming from the sea. And speaking about uh, employment, which of course uh, here is very uh, important, not only they are very important, but the, the growth, the trend is very, very important. You had about 30 million jobs in uh, the maritime fields in 2010, there will be at least, at least, uh, even referring to the most pessimistic uh, prediction, 40 million jobs in 2040. And the same applies for Europe. I have the, uh, I have the figure there, but uh, I would, I would, it would be too long. Um, and uh, in all respects, the, uh, from that economical uh, point of view, in a way, uh, in a way, uh, the maritime activities are the future of, uh, of humanity. When you speak about energy, about food, about research, about pharma, uh, pharmacy, uh, pharmacy, cosmetics, biotechnology, uh, deep, sea, deep sea mining, uh, energies, etc., etc. And not only from that point of view, and then we are turning to what is raising some problem. The ocean are also so important there. You know, 60% of the oxygen, which is in the air that we breathe, is coming from, from ocean. 20 to 30% of the CO2 and all these uh, toxic gases that, we, that uh, uh, we are creating are absorbed by, uh, by uh, the ocean. Today, if we had not the ocean, far more than all the forests together, if the ocean are healed, or if uh, they die, we shall die. The planet, we need the, the ocean. Uh, so, importance of uh, ocean and sea also uh, for the uh, diversity. Uh, we uh, discover about uh, six, uh, 1,600 uh, new species per year. Uh, about half are disappearing. Uh, which is, of course, uh, also uh, quite important. And at the same time, we know only below 5% of the seabed. We know less the ocean, I am sorry to repeat it in front of you, it's, uh, you know that, but we know less uh, the ocean than we know the moon or uh, the hidden face of, uh, of Mars. Only 500 men have gone uh, on the top of uh, Everest. Uh, only two have uh, gone to the deep sea, uh, the real deep seas. Uh, oceans are largely unknown, which is also, of course, a chance 
for uh, the earth and for the uh, humanity, which is a chance for France because we have a very, very big maritime field, uh, because uh, we are facing some shortage uh, on our earth for our own life. But uh, this illustrates very much the need that we have to protect the oceans. The seas, all these big, uh, huge oceans, 70% of the, of the Earth, it's a limited world. It's a fragile world. If you put all of them in one cube, this cube would just have 11, uh, 1,100 kilometers side. Fishing, we have all the statistics about 80% of uh, the uh, uh, fish stocks, halieutic stocks, are at the top or overpass the renewable, the, the possibility of being renewed. Pollution is uh, about 6 million tons per uh, year uh, of uh, all sorts of uh, pollutions are coming, which we are going into the oceans, without counting the plastic, which is a, very, a real disaster, between 10 depending on the areas, 10 and uh, or the moment, 10 or 30 millions, uh, uh, million of uh, plastic tons are uh, going into the sea. And uh, they create, you know, we are producing 380 million tons of plastic per year. And uh, this is, uh, will still uh, go on growing at least for the next uh, 20 years. So it's a real problem, it's a real challenge. And you have all the accidents. You know, we all, when we speak about Fukushima, we think of a, a nuclear disaster, of course. But in two days, six million tons, six million tons, five million tons, sorry, uh, of all sorts of wastes and uh, went to the ocean, half sank. You had uh, everything, cars, locomotives, tanks, uh, etc. And uh, every time you have a tsunami, or a, it is, uh, the, the impact is, uh, is very, very, very big. So this is illustrating the absolute necessity of the uh, sustainable development, not only as a word, but uh, because not only the sea uh, and the oceans are, are, uh, are um, beautiful, but they are absolutely necessary for our life, as I said. And that's why this One Ocean Summit of next week is, uh, is so important. We have to succeed to do it with men, not against men, if not, it will not work. And uh, it can work. I will end with that. You know, you are young. Sometimes it is so bloody depressing what is uh, happening. But it can work. I will give you a, a, a few examples. The uh, oil pollution has, be divided, has been divided per 20 in the last 20 years. All the deballasting of the ships have about, about disappeared from the European waters. Nobody would have bet on that. Um, the uh, ozone, I will give you an example which is not maritime, but which I think might be very important for you. My generation, and even yours, you are a bit young, quite a bit younger than me, a few years ago, let's say 20 years ago, we were all convinced that uh, we, ha we had a big problem with the ozone, comment uh, uh, the, the ozone layer, and uh, it was quite, it seems, it seemed really to be quite irrevers irreversible. And uh, it was really uh, uh, making all of us very, very anxious. And finally, it has been solved. It is not said. Of course, it, it was not on the first page of the papers. But now, for uh, uh, this is two years ago that a study was published uh, demonstrating that thanks to measures which was taken, which were taken by men, you know, by men, by people, by humanity, in a context where we were not believing that it would be possible, uh, now the ozone layer is being rebuilt with the equivalent of two or three times the uh, superficy uh, surface of India, for instance, and we know that it will be, whatever happens, it will be reconstituted around 2050. So it is worth fighting. And I was speaking about the employment. Uh, many young people today, they are very right. They need to have a sense in their life. And they like to work in the green areas. And they, but there is another way, is to work in all fields, any fields, not only the green ones, but to, 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 
to work in these files, and especially in the maritime file, to uh, make them progress, to make them being greener and cleaner. It is not only the green fields, probably, but all fields are waiting for you, helping in that respect. Now we'll ask uh, um, Christine Cabot to, uh, to come here and... Uh, I have to go here? Okay. Uh, no, 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 you can I stay can here stay. if you want. Okay. Christine is... Uh, is, uh, 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 is the vice uh, executive vice president of CMA CGM. She will speak about it, and she will speak replying to this challenge: uh, chances, opportunities, but risks also uh, from a, from an uh, economical point of view and from an environmental point of view. Uh, she will uh, speak about uh, the reply which is brought to this challenge, this double challenge, by a real global operator, the main one in France, in the maritime field. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Francis. Thank you very much for inviting uh, us over to, 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 to for this very interesting discussion. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the maritime supply chain. Um, we are CMA CGM, we are a shipping company, French shipping company. We are number three in the world in terms of what we call the static capacity. Static capacity means uh, how, many, um, uh, ha ha how many containers we can carry uh, at the same time with the number of ships we deploy to make it easy. This is counted uh, as a TEU, this means 20 equivalent units, which, which is the... the, the accounting method we have to, to calculate the capacity of, of, of shipping. Um, CMA CGM, we operate more than 550 ships in the world. We own 250 of them from the biggest uh, capacity of 23,000 TEUs, 20 equivalent uh, units, to uh, the smallest, uh, uh, which can be as small as 500 or 600 TEUs. Uh, this fleet is obviously very versatile, uh, so 250 ships owned, 300 ships which are what we call chartered. Chartered means that the ship is rented uh, from a ship owner for a period of time which can be very short or very long at a, a leasing cost. Um, we of course carry goods uh, throughout the world um, and to do that uh, on board our ships we have seafarers. I would like to say a word first about seafarers because uh, the COVID situation has been a very, very big challenge for seafarers of, of the world, not only in the containerized, uh, with the containerized fleet, but for all the maritime fleet. Seafarers have been uh, uh, frontline workers in the, in the fight against COVID. They have uh, um, had to sustain very difficult conditions because they were obviously uh, calling in all the ports of the world and they, they, we, we had to implement very strict um, protocol to protect them uh, until such time as we could have the vaccination. Uh, we were all uh, locked down in our apartments but the seafarers were at sea and we're continuing to operate ships so that we could have delivered uh, the mask, uh, the medical uh, equipment uh, but also everything we bought on Amazon or uh, all the uh, the internet uh, to, to to sustain our life as normal as possible, and, and seafarers were in the front front line. So, the life at sea is not always easy. This is something I wanted to to say. But I think that for seafarers, it's also a wonderful adventure to, adventure to be uh, to be on board a ship and to and to and to and to and to do this job. Um, Ships are very important, of course, for the international supply chain, but of course, uh, ships have to be loaded and discharged in ports, and ports play a key element in the fluidity of the supply chain. And then, once a container has been loaded or discharged in a port, the container has to be transferred uh, to a warehouse, uh, has to be unstuffed, has to be, and then finally, the goods has to reach. Uh, it's its final place of conception. Or for uh, raw materials, it has to go into the plants where it's going to be processed. Which means that if you want a um, maritime supply chain which works well, you need to make sure that the land infrastructures and the land delivery means will also be flawless. Um, and this has been the case 
over the past uh, 40, 50 years of, uh, of shipping, container, containerization started in the 1960s. Uh, it's become now what it is that is uh, a, a huge, uh, the, 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 the main uh, um, tool to transport uh, cargoes, all types of cargoes. Without containerization in the world, uh, we would not have all the uh, uh, amenities and facilities that we enjoy uh, today. Uh, the uh, internet delivery uh, model would, would not be what it is. So containerization is a key element of the globalization and of the conception, the new conception world as, as we see it today. Um, so this uh, very fluid supply chain has been going on for years and then all of a sudden for the past 18 months we see that there is a congested element, there is a, a lot of bottlenecks everywhere in the world and suddenly the fluidity is no longer what it used to be. Uh, the reason for this lack of fluidity, sudden lack of fluidity are, are, are multiple. Number one, after uh, the first uh, months of sideration after COVID, uh, when we started to open again the world and started to open again our lives, uh, there has been a huge acceleration of demand across the world, which brought all the ship owners uh, to um, combine all the available um, shipping capacity to uh, uh, answer to the demand to provide the necessary supply and to bring the goods where it was needed. Uh, this huge acceleration uh, brought about a lot of congestion in ports. Uh, maybe Emile will tell us about the port of Rotterdam. But I, to give you an example, today for a ship arriving in the vicinity of the port of Los Angeles, you have to queue for close to 14 days, one for 14 days, because you can come to the berth and start discharging your cargoes. This is a situation which has been unheard of uh, since the beginning of, 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 of shipping, modern shipping. Same in the biggest ports of the world. You know that the uh, five biggest ports of the world are, are Asian. Uh, Rotterdam, which is one of the biggest ports in the world, is only number 10 or 11. And uh, only Asian ports uh, uh, ahead, of, ahead of Rotterdam. So even the biggest Chinese ports of the world today are suffering from congestion. Is this a short-term blip? I don't think so. I think there is a structural problem in our supply chain um, situation whereby we will have to live with a new normal where uh, the um, access to the birth, because we having a deficit in our infrastructures because the demand for maritime transportation, the demand for supp supply chain has never been so big and it will continue to be big because the majority of the economies are showing a healthy growth, which is good. But then we have to cope with a structural deficit of our infrastructures and we have to um, look for uh, new ways uh, as all the shipping stakeholders, how are we going to go back to, uh, to, to restore a little bit of fluidity in the, the supply chain, which is today uh, very, very disturbed by, by, by the bottlenecks we, 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 we are experiencing. Bottlenecks in ports. Uh, COVID has not uh, made it any easier because uh, COVID is creating uh, uh, some uh, temporary lack of manpower. This lack of manpower has an impact in the delays because you need uh, people to... Uh, I was talking about seafarers, but uh, dock workers are also extremely important in the fluidity of the supply chain. You need people to discharge the ships, even it's, if it's, of course, uh, heavily automated and with... Uh, uh, big uh, big gantry cranes and and and, key and equipment to, to discharge the ships. Still, you need people to operate them. So COVID has created blips uh, with uh, the availability of manpower, and then you need also uh, people to uh, drive the trucks. You need people to operate the warehouses. You need people to uh, prepare the cargo in the warehouses, and this is also creating today uh, bottlenecks. So we have to face a new shipping situation. And we have all the, sh the, 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 sh the shipping stakeholders, we have to uh, sit, brainstorm together, find new ways. How can we restore more fluidity in the supply chain? At CMACGM, uh, we uh, strongly believe that shipping goes together with logistics. Um, and we have decided to invest not only in shipping, we are number three in the world in the, as far as shipping is concerned, but we are also 
uh, a big logistic uh, operator with our subsidiary SIVA, and we believe that investing in logistics, which we regularly do, is also a key to the future because whoever can give to a customer the full um, uh, door to door deliveries with the full supply chain services um, uh, ar ar around this uh, has the capacity to assist in restoring uh, a better fluidity in the supply chain. So we invest heavily into, into logistic development, into supply chain facilities, in the, uh, not only in Europe, but also in the US and, and also in Asia, because we believe that there's a lot we can do here to uh, give to uh, the customers a better service. Uh, we have also started uh, to, to, to be able to, to, to offer the full, the full um, service option, full option. Um, we have started to invest in air transportation because uh, it is also, uh, f um, Francis was talking about the fact that 90% of the goods are, 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 are transported by sea, but some goods also are transported by rail and are also transported by air freight. And again, to be able to give to your customers the full-fledged service uh, in these supply chain uh, options. We, uh, our chairman, Rodolphe Saidi, has decided to invest also in air freight and we have started to operate uh, for uh, uh, freight aircrafts, and we have ordered some more, which will be delivered in a couple of months. Uh, we'll have uh, six uh, aircrafts ready to, uh, to, 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 to provide this service also for our customers. Because supply chain management is not such an easy uh, thing to do. And uh, experts as we are, uh, together with uh, port stakeholders, uh, like the Port of Rotterdam or the Port of Le Havre, uh, we need together to um, be able to put together solution to, to, to help to, to fluidify this, 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 this supply chain. Uh, facilitate the deliveries. Uh, facilitating the deliveries helps to keep the prices stable. Because lately, because of this dis the, the disruption, the prices have gone up tri tremendously. Because uh, lack of fluidity brings with it a uh, cost increase everywhere because you like uh, cost agility, you like cost efficiency, so this is leading to cost increase. Uh, there is a lack of shifts today on the market, there is a lack of containers to transport the goods, and this is bringing the prices higher. So if we can restore more fluidity, then probably this will help to stabilize the cost factor of transportation. Last thing, but not the least in the challenges ahead of uh, maritime transportation is about sustainability and protection of the environment. Uh, Francis was mentioning that uh, sea transportation is amongst the less uh, impacting in carbon footprint, maybe, but still it is impacting our environment because of CO2 emissions. At CMA CGM, we have decided that we want to be pioneers in putting together solutions to reduce the uh, CO2 emission of maritime transportation. Of course, we are not going to be able to um, uh, fulfill this challenge on our own. Uh, to do that, the maritime community, the maritime stakeholders need to create ecosystems together with the energy providers, together with scientists, together with academics, so that we can find a solution to reduce progressively the carbon emissions of maritime transportation. At CMACGM, we have decided that the best and most efficient solution today is to uh, look for uh, LNG propulsion for our engine, liquefied natural gas. This is less carbon, uh, the, the carbon footprint of gas is less by up to 20% than the carbon footprint of fuel, heavy fuel, which um, is used commonly in, for, for ship engines. It is the beginning of the story towards decarbonization. It is certainly not the end, but we've got, you've got to start somewhere. So we have decided that we will um, innovate in building new ships, which will be capable of being propelled with LNG. Today we operate 24 LNG propelled ships in our fleet. By 2024, mm -hmm. we will have 44 ships LNG propelled in our ships. But we are already looking at what is the next step. The next step is to find if, uh, uh, an energy which will be even less, um, have le even less CO2 emission than, than LNG, which still is a fossil fuel, 
And we are looking at anything, uh, uh, all types of biofuels, biomethane, and eventually also looking at what we call e-methane, that is that you, you manufacture um, uh, methane by, with using carbon capture and green hydrogen. Uh, of course, this raises the subject of scalability. Uh, how can we together make sure that we produce sufficient synthetic gas to be able to propel the whole um, uh, trade uh, uh, fleet in the world? So this is a challenge, but at CMACGM we have decided to take it up and to work on R&D uh, with our partners, uh, with our, uh, with our uh, suppliers on looking at what is the next step for the future solutions. Uh, how do we operate our ships better? How do we build our ships better? L we work a lot on hydrodynamis um, hydrodynamism, hi aerodynamism, to make sure that we can um, also with uh, the type of ships we build and the type of ships we use, that we can uh, less and less uh, have uh, CO2 emissions. We are also looking at wind assistance, because maybe wind assistance is part of the solution. Uh, we are also convinced that in the way forward, uh, our commitment is to be a net zero by 2050. This is a stepped approach, it will be progressive. And in the way forward that we, 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 we are taking, there will not be one solution in the end, there will be a multi-solution, uh, which will help to progressively reduce the impact of CO2. Uh, for, for, for maritime transportation and as I explained to you after maritime or before maritime transportation you have land transportation and you need also to find ways to decarbonize the transportation on land uh, and I'm suppose, I I'm sh uh, suppose Emil will tell us something about decarbonization in, in, in ports as well and with port equipment because this is also something very important. So two main challenges for maritime transportation in the future, restore the fluidity uh, so that the supply chain can really deliver based on an expected uh, transit time and expected delivery period, which will help to fluidify the supply chain and stabilize the cost all along the supply chain. Number two, uh, the environmental challenge, which is a planet uh, subject, but which is taken very seriously by uh, the shipping community extremely seriously by CMA, CGM, we are already very active. This will take investment, this will take R&D, this will take, as I said, ecosystem, because again, it will not be the solution of one, it will be the solution of a community, a maritime community, which needs to join forces and work continuously towards this, uh, this improvement. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much, Christine, that was really brilliant. By the way, I apologize because I just realized when I looked at you that I did put my mask just when I went to the microphone, which, uh, so sorry for the audience. Certainly, it, it was not so clear. Uh, Christine, just uh, one question before uh, uh, we go to our Dutch friend. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, big ship owners, especially of big vessels, are quite often now more and more under fire as being uh, the main tool of globalization, as if they were responsible for the evolution of the world and for the social consequences and all of this sort of thing. Don't you think that one of the replies to that is that on the long term, when uh, globalization has a bit evoluted, we shall one day, uh, it, it will help uh, to go back to regionalization. First of all, first of all so re rebalancing the world, and second, if that is the case, is it in a very long, uh, and how will you adapt? I know ship owners always adapt themselves. So, um, so first of all, we are a service provider. Okay, so uh, shipping is there to um, give a solution to um, the demand, which is how can we ship goods in the most efficient, in the safest, in the most efficient way from a point A to point B. Uh, we have seen uh, in the last 20 years the uh, spectacular increase of the demand from Asia. Uh, Asia has become the factory of the world. 
sheep owners have uh, adapted to the demand of providing services to and from Asia to uh, the, the, the whole, uh, the, the, whole the, uh, the widest possible range of ports in the planet. Uh, we uh, will adapt to a demand which will possibly uh, change along the next coming years, if it does change. We see regionali regionalization as a possible complement to um, what happens today. Uh, COVID as, um, and, and the bottlenecks I was talking about uh, are certainly um, um, uh, created with uh, um, uh, the, our customers, uh, the, the, the some, some uh, necessity for them to uh, split their sourcing uh, to have um, production which is closer, uh, some production which is closer to the, 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 the place of consumption. Uh, and we see that regionalization is gaining a little bit market shares, but uh, Asia remains Asia. And uh, ex the exceptional formidable capacity of production that is today with the Asian countries will remain uh, for the next years uh, the place where uh, production will be centered. Uh, but again, we see more and more customers who uh, wish to have a diversified, more diversified sourcing and who are asking us to be able to transport for them from Asia, of course, for the biggest part, but also in a growing trend from uh, closer sourcing like Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Central Europe, um, Turkey, Morocco, uh, and, and sourcing is, is indeed being diversified. We are service provider, we will adapt to uh, what our customers will, 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 ask, us to, will ask us to do. Uh, we closely follow uh, the evolution of, of the trade demands, but for the time being, Asia remains uh, what it has been for the past 10, 15, 20 years, which is a place where um, capacity is needed to transport goods and to reply to the world demand. So for the predi predictable future, no huge change. Maybe a slow evolution. Maybe slow and evolution, yeah. but yeah. and and this is this is good. To the diversification is is is, is not is not a bad thing. Um, but uh, again, uh, the, the 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 huge um, production centers, uh, China, Southeast Asia, uh, North Asia, these big Asian countries remain uh, for will, will remain uh, what they are today, and 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 demand will 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 still be there. Okay, the question wasn't easy, but the reply was clear. Thank you very much, Christine. Do you want to add something? No. no, not at this moment. Anyway, that will be a general debate. So, Probably. and now, uh, Mr. Hofstede, we are so happy that you are here. You are representing Rotterdam. You know, during years when I was a, a pupil and then a student, we were so proud to have a, in Europe the first port in the world. <laughs> okay. Now we have all these phenomenons which we know, which, uh, which, which happened, and uh, you are still by far the first one in uh, Europe. But yes, you said 10s or 11s, which is illustrating when you go to Rotterdam and that you think that they are only the tens, you can imagine. It's a, but we are uh, very proud of uh, what you, you, you are doing. You are also uh, uh, inspiring uh, uh, a lot of evolutions in Europe, and I would like very much that you witness about that, please. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, happy to be here. And uh, first of all, thank you all for speaking English on my behalf. Uh, I'm very happy with that. Otherwise, <coughs> I said before, otherwise my answers would be very short. Um, and you started uh, uh, in your introduction about uh, the challenges uh, of the sea. And of course, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we have learned to live with that. Uh, where I live in Rotterdam, uh, my house is actually 10 meters below sea level. Um, uh, so, and, and yesterday, uh, I think in a large part of Europe, we had a big storm. And actually 70 years ago, was also uh, on this day, uh, yesterday and today, we had also such a big storm. And then a large part of the Netherlands was flooded and a lot of people died. 
Um, but of course, over the years, we've learned to adapt. And we've learned to live with the challenges. We've learned to work around the challenges and come up with solutions. And, and, and in some way, this is also actually what you were talking about, is that you have to be able, in, in, in shipping in general, to adapt to the changes. Um, if we talk about trade, I think uh, uh, one of the biggest innovations actually was the container, which is was at that time a wooden box, and then it was a, a steel box, and now a uh, alumina box. Um, but this 20 foot, 40 foot, 6 uh, meters, 12 meters long box, which is actually a simple thing, but it really changed world trade. And uh, it brought a lot of good uh, 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 welfare, well-being, but also helped developing countries. Also made it possible to get uh, all kinds of uh, medication, uh, 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 health equipment and what have you, to developing countries, uh, uh, made sure that there was a lot of uh, jobs and therefore also money available. And in that sense, and I don't want to be too, too dramatic, but still helped uh, diminishing poverty in the world. And I really believe in that. I, I think that's true. At the same time, container shipping, to container logistics, as you say, uh, uh, poses a lot of challenges. Well, first of all, what, what we've seen throughout the years is indeed in 1964, Rotterdam became the biggest port in the world. Uh, we kept that position until 2004, and that was after uh, China uh, uh, joined the World Trade Organization, and that changed the whole world. We don't mind, because that helped Rotterdam and Europe as well. So uh, that was a good thing. But now, indeed, Rotterdam is number 10 or 11, um, uh, still uh, uh, the biggest uh, in, in Europe. Mainly, well, in containers, but also uh, in total, uh, but also mainly because of our liquid bulk position. Uh, crude oil, fuel oil, uh, uh, those kind of products. But that is going to change. So we were the biggest port in the world for 40 years, then World Trade Organization, uh, WTO, uh, 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 changed that position. We had to adapt, and we did. And, 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 and now we are facing a transition, energy transition, uh, logistics transition, and we will have to adapt again uh, and make sure that this change is not just uh, a challenge, but we, we, we grab the opportunities that it brings. And I think that is, in general, in, in, in logistics, uh, uh, shipping, that is uh, a mentality, that is the nature of the game, that we, you, have to, you have to change, you have to, you have to adapt. So, uh, if you first of all look at the uh, logistic challenges uh, uh, that we are facing now, Actually, they're not new. They're just aggravated by COVID, by the Suez Canal. Um, transportation of goods via containers is very easy. I mean, you put a lot of uh, 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 goods in a box and then you send it from Shanghai to La Havre or to Rotterdam or to New York or, or, or what have you. The whole point is that in that box, there are a lot of owners, different owners of uh, uh, goods. So not all containers contain the, the, the goods of one company. So there's, there's more companies attached to it. And then you have uh, a lot of different trans transportation companies. And then you have freight forwarders. And then you have shipping agents. And then you have customs. And then you have shipping lines. On the Asian side and as well on the European side. And nobody has full insight. Nobody has all the information at any time and full transparency. Um, so that is, that's important to realize. So uh, I always say uh, this year, last year, it was the first year when uh, we handled more than 15 million TEU in Rotterdam. Uh, but if you break it down in small batches, then actually there are so many parties involved in those 15 million. It's not just a few big players. But if one of the biggest shippers via Rotterdam is... Uh, you might have heard of it, Heineken beer. 
Uh, and, uh, but they only handle 80,000 more or less TU through Rotterdam. So 80,000 TU is the biggest shipper and we handle in total 15 million. So you can imagine that there are many different parties. So if you then look at uh, 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 the bigger vessels, 24,000 TU vessels coming on stream, 24,000 TU vessel comes into our port. It exchanges, for instance, 10,000 containers at one time. But then we have not one of these big vessels. We have five vessels at the same time calling in Rotterdam. So 50,000 containers are loaded, discharged at one moment, at one time in the port. And then you get all the feeder vessels. You get the barges, you get the trains, you get... There is a mismatch in the system because you get the 24,000 TU vessels and then you get a barge or train collecting 10, 15, 20 containers. So there's a huge gap what the shipping line is bringing and what the hinterland uh, 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 operators are taking from, from the port. And with all these uh, uh, different companies involved and everybody holding p a piece of the information, what is crucial is that we go more and more to transparency in the system, that we share information uh, that we share data, that we share planning, so that everybody knows from each other, okay, what am I expecting? What am I bringing? When? When do I expect you to take it? And this sounds very simple, but if we talk about digitization, because next to energy transition, di digitization is one of the big themes now in logistics, then we talk about sharing actually relatively simple data, simple information between all those parties. So that when the vessel is leaving Shanghai, already in Rotterdam, we know what is on board, when is the container collected, by which modality, so that we can really make sure that with the capacity that we have, we can make optimal use of this. So what we're working on uh, 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 in, in Rotterdam, as much as we can together with, because with, 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 with the shipping lines, with the terminal operators, is making sure that we work towards that transparency, that we share information, that information is available. So that's, that's one big change, if you like, that, that, that we were now uh, working on. Uh, the other one, so making sure that the flow is as seamless and as smooth as possible, thereby not creating uh, congestion, making use of all the assets, and diminishing uh, emissions, CO2 emissions. Because if it's, if it's fluid, then you have less emissions. Secondly, we're working on uh, 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 energy transition, so the biofuel. So we're very happy that CMA, as uh, the first, has really chosen as a big shipping line, one of the major players, to make use of LNG, big time. And it was, that takes courage, because nobody really knows what the end game will be and what the end solution will be. And we all know this is an intermediate solution because it's still fossil. And it takes a lot of investment, so it takes a lot of courage, but CMA did it. And, and then we work in Rotterdam together with CMA, making sure that there's uh, plenty of LNG available, that uh, the vessels can be bunkered with LNG simultaneously during operations. So we work together on a safe, secure, reliable operation. And as Christine said, this is not the end game because now we're working on having sufficient methanol and then later e-methanol or maybe synthetic LNG uh, or maybe even ammonia later, which is very clean, but of course there's also a dangerous issue uh, uh, attached to that. So uh, that is also something that, 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 that we're working on uh, uh, to make sure that we have solutions and we have sufficient supply. Because with all these solutions, it's important that CMA knows there's availability, it's not too expensive, it's sustainable, and it's in operationally, it's easy to use and take, take on board. So uh, we're working on the biofuels, there's some huge investments now in the port into biofuels. So, and, what we're also doing, because uh, I think uh, uh, we were the biggest port once for 40 years, 
We're not the biggest port now, and that's okay because we benefit from, from, from world trade. What is important is that we are an efficient port, a reliable port, uh, and that we are at the forefront of these developments and that we work along, think along with our customers. But it also means, if you, especially if you look at uh, transparency and digitization, that yes, there is huge competition uh, within Northwestern European ports. There's huge competition, but at the same time, we also are looking for cooperation, cooperation of sharing information, making sure that in this competitive environment, we still make sure that uh, uh, all transport flows are handled as efficient as possible. So it's not anymore keeping information for yourself and then hoping that Le Havre or Antwerp will not have the information and then we will get the, the business, that's old school, really old school. You really have to make sure that you offer, as Northwestern Europe, the most optimal solution for transportation and make sure that you make, and that's a motherhood statement or that's maybe easy said, but I mean it, that we make the cake bigger with each other and within that bigger cake, we have the competition. And that helps our customers, and at the same time, it makes sure that they still can choose between the ports, because that is what the shipping lines love most, choice. Um, so, and what, what is also an important factor in this digitization is that um, what you see changing uh, is that big parties who are not directly at the forefront of logistics because of this digitization are, and because of their, uh, uh, how big they are, their scale, um, they are getting more and more involved in logistics and transpa transportation. Of course, Amazon and Alibaba are the most important examples, but you see it happening. So there are different parties coming to the table. So we have to make sure uh, uh, that we're ready for them and that we have the hinterland connectivity and that we have the information available. Um, and coming back to your question about um, uh, nearshoring, I fully agree with you. Uh, yes, you see some developments and you see some trends uh, and you see some companies moving some businesses back to Europe. But at the same time, that's also not an easy solution because we have an issue in Europe with sufficient labor, uh, 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 costs, uh, but also uh, connectivity. So I don't think there will be a huge change. So coming back in the end of 1950s, the container was developed. That was the biggest invention. And that changed world trade. Then we got WTO and that changed actually uh, the, the, the center of gravity from Europe, if you like, to uh, Asia. And now we have uh, supply chain uh, disruption. We have energy transition. And again, we have to make sure that we adapt. And, and, and then you see, uh, and I, I won't talk for myself, but if you then look at CMA, you see CMA is adapting continuously. And that is the name of the game. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, one question about uh, Rotterdam itself and uh, one question more European, I would say. About Rotterdam, apart or on top of your talent as a Dutch for commerce, for uh, all what is maritime and transportation, you have a big uh, tram card, which is the River Rhine, of course, Absolutely. leading you to the, uh, yes. uh, the heart of Europe. Yes. Uh, do you think, what is your guess, uh, that in the coming years, thanks or due to the efforts which are made by other parts of Europe to go until uh, the heart of Europe, uh, from a comparative point of view, uh, are you fearing it? Are you encouraging it? Do you think it will change something in your situation or not? Uh, that, uh, that's absolutely a very good question. Um, we talk a lot, a lot about it within, uh, within the port. Uh, we're not fearing it. Um, uh, again, uh, and that's not out of arrogance, but uh, it is happening. So there's no yeah. use in fear. 
I mean, you have to deal with it, and again, you have to adapt. And of course, we have had our issues recently with the River Rhine. Too low water, too high water, uh, accidents. And then the, the river is blocked, or you cannot sail, and then you have an issue. Because uh, then yeah. the train uh, tracks are, are full, uh, there are not, a lot, not enough truckers. You see, uh, and that's uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of the examples you, you used, is you see the, the, the ports, um, whether it's a Trieste or a Rijeka or uh, uh, Savona Vado, or, uh, yeah, they're, they're developing. You see the, the, the rail connection between China and uh, uh, Europe. So those are all things, I mean, it's not... All these developments in itself are not really changing the game materially because there's still 50 million TU coming to Northwestern Europe. So we're still a very important point in the, in, in the logistics. But adding everything up and the development, then all of a sudden it is uh, an issue. But, and that's what I meant, we have to adapt and we have to make sure that we are at the forefront and that at the end of the day, we have solutions. Not one, but various solutions. And that is making sure that we are efficient, reliable, uh, making sure that, that, that we have all the information that is necessary, uh, real-time, dynamically available. Making sure that we have all the solutions. So if CMA tomorrow decides for methanol, we have to make sure that we have sufficient supply of methanol. If they decide for something else, we have to make sure that we have something else. And uh, we have to make sure that uh, if something happens on the River Rhine, then we have sufficient backup capacity in the rail. So what I'm saying is that it's important that we have to realize that most of it, I mean, we cannot change the development of Rijeka and Trieste and, and Koper and, and what have you, but we have to make sure that we are the best answer to all the questions. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Just add to that. Um, I think the carbon footprint calculation of routing from uh, point A to B is going to be something very important for the customers in the years to come. And one of the challenges of shipping lines, ports, and the various routings is to be able to offer to the customers several solutions. <coughs> you want to go from point A to point B, you have several routing solutions. You can calculate your transit time, you can calculate your cost, and you can calculate your carbon footprint. Yes. And then the customer should be able at some point enough to decide, I want the, you know, yeah. like uh, when you do your, on Google, your, your itinerary, yeah? uh, shortest way, but uh, more expensive because I will take the motorway and I have to pay yeah. the toll, or I take the longer way and I have a lesser carbon footprint and can I afford it? Is my delivery time allowing me to take the long way? And I think it will be a multitude of solu multiple solutions that we will have as shipping lines and as ports to be able yeah. to offer to our customers. Yeah. Because the carbon footprint element is going to That's come yeah. in yeah. play big time yeah. in, the, in yeah. the years to come in the, the routing choices mm. of our yeah. customers. And if I may to react to that and also then uh, also coming back to your earlier question, we have developed such a tool at the port of Rotterdam. And the tool we, uh, it was named, is named Navigate. So that's a tool that wherever you are in the world, and I want to ship my goods, so what is the best way, the fastest way via Rotterdam and then to the hinterland? And that is uh, shortest transit time uh, overseas, uh, what type of connectivity, rail, barge, truck, uh, uh, what is uh, the connectivity, what is the days of travel, and what is your CO2 footprint? So we've done that for Rotterdam. And then, I mean, all routes lead via Rotterdam. <laughs> Isn't that a coincidence? And then we thought, well, that's a bit silly. Uh, and then we said, well, maybe we should do it for all ports, at least in, in, in Western Europe. And then we said, well, if we do that, then some of the routings are possibly better via Antwerp or Bremerhaven. And then we said, well, we take that risk, but we want to have, we want to open up that information. Yeah. We want to make sure exactly what you say, that customers can choose what is the best route. And sometimes, hopefully most of the times, that's best via Rotterdam and then barge rail, what have you. 
And sometimes it's better to go via Le Havre or Hamburg. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Maybe uh, Marseille. Yeah, who knows? Uh, Foss. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, my second question was, but it is also addressed to uh, Stéphane Raison, who is uh, uh, waiting for, <laughs> for him to, to, inter to interfere, uh, and who will speak, by the way, I say today, uh, to, to now, I must say, uh, will speak about the uh, uh, new uh, last uh, French uh, reply uh, to these challenges which we mentioned with Haropa. He will come back on it. But before going to that, and that might be a transition, this question is also addressed to, uh, to you both. Uh, you as Rotterdam, you as maybe as a former uh, boss of the uh, Port of Marseille. Uh, is it a silly question? Is it a clever question? Is it a nightmare? Is it a dream? To ask you uh, whether at the European level, one day the ports uh, would really would not uh, have a really a real interest not only to cooperate but to coordinate each other to uh, spread the areas to uh, uh, speaking at, at the level of european continent rather than competing each other in all fields um, is it realistic uh, life is such that it may be a dream but it will never happen is it justified I'm not, I think it's a dream, and I'm not sure if it's a bad dream or a good dream, but uh, I don't think so. I, I believe that we should cooperate wherever we can, but we should compete uh, if, if there's room to compete. Because I believe, I mean, we have, as Rotterdam, if you talk about containers, we have the biggest competi competition recent years with uh, Antwerp and before that with Hamburg. But I believe that through competition, we are constantly pushing, ourse pushing ourselves to be better, every day to be better and to have a better service and be more efficient. But that in itself, as I said earlier, it also means that sometimes we share information to make sure that overall the whole system is more efficient, but then we still can compete and must compete. Okay. Uh, today, Francis, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, we have a lack of port capacity uh, and, it, and it's a big problem today, so it's not about competition, it's about can we create, uh, can we expand port infrastructure, because today there is a big lack of infrastructure in Europe, but also in the US, West Coast, big time, uh, and even in China today, ports are heavily congested, mm. so it's not about competition today, today it's about, is there anything we can do in Europe so that we can expand the, capaci the port capacity, uh, to be able to serve better uh, the maritime transportation. The it problem is that you issue. are uh, quite <laughs> clever and convincing. I am not convinced that there is a, that competition has only advantages. What you said is a very traditional reply, which is true. Uh, competition is forcing it's to improve, but sometimes you have to organize each other to face other challenges, yeah. outside challenges, and you may be more united by coordinating. And, uh, but I, I take on board your reply because after all, I am not an expert at all, but I am astonished by the such because I think there is still competition, which is okay. Mr. Raison, you waited a lot, <laughs> so uh, now the floor is yours. No, thank you, Francis. The microphone is yours, sorry. You, you can hear me, Francis? How it works. Hopefully. Hello? Okay, can you hear me? Oh yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah good, good, good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to, to take part in this conference. Um, unfortunately, I, I have not been able to join Paris as you have seen, uh, and please accept all my apologies for that, but uh, you know that um, Aropa Port is quite new. Uh, we are young uh, establishment, a new company, and I have to to finalize some urgent point this afternoon with my colleagues in Rouen. So, um, Francis, if you permit to begin with uh, a few words about our report and our first transnational year. Um, and to begin with, first of all, the, I, I will um, speak about the context of this year. In, in 2021, French economic growth returned to 7%. Uh, more or less it pre it pre pandemic level and this is a good result offset by rising inflation against the backdrop of an aid 
to the government whatever it costs economic support policy and a major expansion in public sector debt. The second point of uh, 2021, um, and it's more specifically in the maritime sector, uh, the worldwide container traffic rose by 13.5% year on year, uh, reaching 88 million TU in the first half of 2021, compared to 78 million TU the previous year. And activity was uh, huge, as you said, together, and, and as you said, Christine and, uh, and Francis. And um, another point uh, in the maritime sector in 2021 was the rates of the freight uh, in the container industry. And um, lastly, um, one major point um, in, in last year was um, the de decarbonization that has become an unavoidable international issue for all the ports, all the states. And, um, and I think that the pandemic has accelerated some of its impact. Um, in France, for example, in, in the Seine River near from Paris, the Grand Puy facility halted its revenue uh, activity in March. Uh, in order to, to begin conversion to biofuels, uh, leading to a decline in liquid bulk traffic. And um, in addition, the health crisis has caused a short-term drop in demand, as Christine said, and the increase in the percentage share of electric uh, vehicles in French national fleet will also confirm over the long term, the downward train in refinery products. So we face in ports uh, now uh, in Rotterdam or in, in Le Havre, for example, or in Rouen now, uh, a, a big change, a huge change of the economics um, in the ports. But where are we now in the beginning of 2022? First of all, uh, Europa port is now a completely operational major river and seaport. We are the first port in France to be also a maritime port, a seaport, and a river port. Um, and what we did during uh, last year, we finalized the governance. Uh, we, we organized at the beginning of July uh, the supervisory uh, board. Uh, in October, we uh, announced the creation of a regional development council in Le Havre, Rouen, and Paris. And um, at the end of the year, we adopt a common tariff policy uh, for the free ports. Uh, it was the direct consequence of a merger. And uh, this year, we have the free port defined the first harmonized tariff strategy for port lands charges and port dues. So uh, we did a lot of, of work uh, with all the staff uh, in the free ports to be sure that the, at the beginning of 2022, we will able to accommodate and to serve all what we say, the, what, what you said uh, together uh, to serve all the customers. And now, um, what are the figures? Uh, at the end of this year, we have a double digit growth, 12% uh, more. Uh, for the first time in all history, our report broke through the symbolic barrier of 3 million TU. Uh, it's very interesting. In, in France, we, we did not break this, this symbolic barrier of 3 million TU. Um, and also, we have a lot of new industrial uh, facilities uh, in the free ports. But more than this, um, what I want to say uh, tonight uh, is that the world is changing fast and ports have to play a role and bring an, a big contribution by developing innovative solutions regarding what are uh, what we are doing in our port, one of the first decisions when we finalize our merger to create the major river and seaport, uh, was to create three new positions um, of transversal project director in our organization 
in order to implement the three major pillars of our strategy plan. Uh, the first appointment was a, a director project for ecological transition. The second one was multimodality and internal connections. And the third one was for digital transition. And the, the digitalization of the supply chain and technological and digital advances are placing data at the center of a new ecosystem in port. For several years now, um, and, and CMA CGN and Merx, you, you have a, a bad example of this. We had a lot of major cyber attacks and they have been becoming more and more recurrent and uh, sophisticated. And in this context, our Papa wants to set an example that will guarantee the security of its data, but also of the data to which is as access throughout the same axis. We also uh, using innovation uh, as an asset for the development of multimodality and innovation and new technologies are essential for the development uh, of the business and as and our tools for performance. Um, but um, all you you spoke about um, uh, cooperation, Paul, and we have uh, an example of cooperation uh, together with the port of Rotterdam. Uh, we are uh, in our port a member of the Magpie uh, Consortium, uh, led by uh, our friends from the port of Rotterdam. And uh, this um, consortium uh, is a unique collaborative effort to set and uh, to be sure that we strengthen the link between uh, um, all the ports and to supply a green energy. And uh, this green energy will be used by the company like uh, uh, CMA CGM or all the, the container company in, in Europe. So it's uh, one example of a cooperation we could have uh, together uh, as you as you said, um, Francis, uh, just just before, but uh, also um, we have a lot to do, and ports have a lot to do uh, for the preservation of, of environment. Uh, global warming is a reality, and uh, it believes that the maritime sector is already making a lot of efforts, as you said, Christine, to cut CO two emissions, and a lot of people have a very very bad image of ports and maritime sectors. You, you were, Christine, in, in Marseille uh, just before, and, and we were colleagues. And uh, um, people think that uh, maritime transport is a very emissive transport. But at the end, uh, the sector of maritime transport just have 1.7% of the total of CO2 emission in the world, and it's only 16% of the world transport sector. So um, as we develop the strategic plan for Aropa port, we are in this line uh, with a ch the challenge of decarbonization to meet the challenge of a national low carbon strategy to limit global warming. warming. So we have a strong uh, ambition on the subject of the ecological transition and uh, we are working a lot uh, with various partners to meet our objective to become a zero emission port by 2050. And uh, at the end of this year, uh, we have the visit of uh, Jean-Baptiste Jebari, our Minister for Transport, and we announced, and we were the first in France to announce that, that the port will develop a decarbonization process for all the, the territory in Le Havre and in Rouen, as the national level and we last years uh, and we uh, last year uh, invest more than 16% of our investment and we allow and we allocated this investment to support the energy transition. So uh, uh, another example, by 2028, uh, our port will be occupied by onshore power supplies for maritime and inland vessel and we sign a MOU with uh, uh, the five ports, uh, the Northwest European port, as you said, uh, uh, we are with, with Rotterdam involved in this MOU to be sure that all the major point ports in Europe will be equipped 
by um, onshore supply uh, power. So uh, it's one of the subjects we could have and we could develop to, to be sure that uh, we will have a good answer to all the customers to be sure that we will decarbonize all the industry. That's uh, uh, some key points we could have uh, uh, together with Anvert, with Rotterdam, with Bremerhaven and Obo. And, and I will, I will perhaps I will say uh, as my colleague in Rotterdam, I think competition is very good for, for, for us. We, we can cooperate, but we are in competition and will compete a lot to perhaps to improve the service we will give to all the companies. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, I also read uh, today, I think, that not only you had 13% growth uh, uh, last year, but 28% on the Cotoner side. So you are on the way to compete Rotterdam, but still the way is long eh, to go. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yes, yes, the, 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 uh, the, the way is long. Yeah, you, you are true, and I, I fully agree. But uh, as Christine said, uh, we like a lot of infrastructure. But at the end of 2024, we will have more than uh, 700 uh, meters of key for CMA CGM, you know, Christine. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> You know, Stéphane Raison and uh, Christine, they have one point in common, or maybe more than one, but one which I know, which is that uh, you were uh, both uh, managing directors of the Dunkirk port. Yes, correct. A good uh, promotion pl platform. <laughs> okay, now uh, I had an agreement with uh, Gilles Gouteux and that uh, we could go for the debate. That's why I, I was not, not so much pressing uh, our speakers or myself, uh, that we could go up till... 8.15 or so on. So please, uh, now, uh, if you have questions, any of you and many of the students, but not only, <laughs> please, uh, time has come. Yeah. Yes? Um, both, I suppose. Um, yes, uh, COVID, COVID raised a lot of challenges. Uh, I was mentioning about the seafarers. Uh, this was a very um, uh, difficult challenge because it was a human challenge. And we, we had to make sure that we protect our seafarers and that we, 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 we keep them uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a working situation which was an, a, a workable environment for them. Uh, we also had to adapt the week very quickly to uh, first month of COVID, uh, demand drops. And then after five months, six months, demand goes sky high. And you need to adapt with your assets, you need to adapt with your agility, you need to adapt you with your teams. Uh, from, day, from one day to the other, everybody locked down, we need to, to, we need to work from home. Uh, first time ever on the planet where everybody had to work from home. It's not only CMA, CGM who adapted, but all the, all, all the companies had to adapt. But, so we had, we had to adapt a lot. And then uh, there was this situation where, um, yes, indeed, uh, there was a, 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 a huge surge in prices, uh, transportation prices, market prices, um, which uh, brought shipping lines, uh, not only CMA, CGM, but all the shipping lines to, to have a, a very good results in, in 2021. By the way, uh, uh, CMA, CGM decided in September 2021 that we will freeze our rates, which we have done. Um, uh, and it, it was a decision we, we, we took because uh, we thought it was reasonable to decide that we, we, should, we should give some stability and visibility to our customers. Uh, but yes, it was a bit of both. It was a bit of uh, 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 an exceptional uh, conjunction of events, which which brought to um, uh, a, a strong surge in 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 demand, resulting in surge in freight rates. Uh, 
uh, but also surge of our cost. Uh, uh, energy costs are going up, uh, gas costs are in goes going up. Uh, it, it all, as I said earlier, when in a disrupted chain, all the costs and your, your uh, are going up. Uh, and at the same time, a challenge for the adaptability, uh, huge challenge for adaptability. Again, uh, uh, demand is down, demand is sky high, Never ne demand was never that high. I mean, there's not a single ship uh, available on the market if you want to charter one. Uh, the, 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 at a certain point in time, we couldn't find containers, we couldn't find uh, capacity to manufacture new containers. So yes, uh, so to reply to your question, it's a bit of both, yes. Good, good conditions, but uh, big challenges, uh, and uh, maybe time to also to 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 say that I think the supply chain as a whole, both in shipping and in logistics, uh, has reacted quite uh, quite well in in this adaptability uh, and uh, with all the the stakeholders of the of of the supply chain community. By the way, I pay tribute to uh, Jean-Emmanuel Sauvé, uh, who is the chairman and the president of Armateur de France, so if you have any questions. <laughs> any other question? You had this gentleman, this gentleman there. Uh, ah, Jean-Emmanuel has a question. No, mais yes, uh, I had yes, given... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, vas-y, vas-y, Jean-Emmanuel. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, have a, I have a question for you. A uh, so. few uh, weeks ago, uh, I was on a ship, uh, a very nice brand new ship, um, located in Rotterdam, name Rotterdam, port of registration Rotterdam. Uh, the cruise line was Holland America Line. <laughs> uh, what, what is your secret? Because you know we are working actively with the French government in order to develop a, a new French maritime policy uh, for flag. Um, and I, I have this question: What is your secret to 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 to, to have? Uh, uh, what is your, your what kind of incentive do you give to your ship owner in order to have such option to have a wonderful uh, cruise ship uh, registered in a, in your port uh, uh, with, with the, the Dutch flag? Mm -hmm. If you have the, the the answer, it will uh, it will be a pleasure to have the, well, to have this uh, this answer. <laughs> If you have, I yeah, yeah, I, 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 I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, uh, explain all the secrets, of course, but, uh, and uh, but I don't, I don't have a, a, um, a specific answer, not in in the way of, uh, but uh, I have, I have a couple of uh, generic answers. First of all, of course, uh, the the H A L Holland America Line, the Dutch America Line, is of course that is tradition. I mean, that started in the 19th century. And then sailed between Rotterdam and New York. Uh, 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 people who immigrated, but also uh, uh, people traveling. Uh, people like Einstein traveled on the Holland America Line between Rotterdam and uh, and, and 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 New York. And uh, of course now uh, the the hull, the H A L Holland America Line, still has roots in uh, uh, Rotterdam, but is actually part of a very large American organization. Uh, but they, of course, Americans also like traditions from emotion, but also from commerce, from trading. Uh, so they keep that. So they find it important also to uh, keep uh, uh, the flag in the Netherlands and certain vessels in the Netherlands. That's, that's one. Um, two is that, of course, uh, uh, we, as, 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 as the Netherlands, we are uh, uh, strong in have always been in shipping, in trading. Um, uh, that is that is from our ancestors and that we've always been. But that also has to do with the fact that we don't have any large industries. Uh, uh, we are a small country. Uh, we have been invaded by every other country in Europe uh, in, 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 in the past. So again, talking about adapting and, and, and making sure and, and knowing that um, if you don't have the strength to tell others what to do, then you have to um, maneuver and you have to be flexible and you have to be agile, as they say it uh, nowadays. So we have to make sure that we make it attractive for companies to come to the Netherlands, to trade with the Netherlands, to uh, transport via the ne Netherlands. Um, uh, so, uh, and I think that is in our DNA. And that you will find 
uh, in Rotterdam, but also you find it with the government in, 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 in The Hague, that we know uh, where our strength lies and we know where our weaknesses are. Uh, and this is one of our strengths. That's, so it's focus. Maybe, I, that's the answer. I don't think that uh, Jean-Emmanuel will be satisfied, but I can tell you, I, uh, I worked 27 years with uh, Dutch and with the Netherlands. I never found the secret. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Yes, good, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Nicolas Wickenstoff. I'm working in civil aviation. Civil aviation is a, a junior sector that started and tried to mirror as much as possible what was developed in the maritime sector. The regulations of civil aviation are very close to those of uh, the maritime sector. If you look at the insurance market, you see also that we have uh, copy-pasted a lot of what is being done in this industry. So I was interested in making some, in trying whether it was possible to make some comparison, in particular regarding the contribution to the world economy that you have presented at the very beginning. Uh, working in Brussels for quite a number of years, I was lobbying, as many of us do, to explain why civil aviation is that important for the world economy. And because, at the end of the day, civil aviation is a very small sector, in reality. We had to boost a bit and show muscles, etc., and uh, with a tendency to adding to civil aviation a lot of other things that were probably not totally linked to civil aviation, it was interesting to see if in the figures that you have given, um, oh, did you embrace all the activities in relation to the maritime activities? As we in civil aviation, as an example, we add the jobs in the manufacturing industry, the airlines, the airports, which are very similar to the, to the port themselves. And uh, to speak like some economists do, we take only, not only the direct uh, staff, the direct jobs, but we add uh, the indirect one. You see everything that you can get, get indirectly, the induced staff or um, GDPs. And we even go to, as far as saying um, catalytic benefit. So a scientist knows what catalytic means, but typically in our world, we tend to say, look... You have a the, question? You, the, the, <laughs> yes. The tourism industry uh, that is supported by, by, by civil aviation. What is it that you do when you make your lobby vis-a-vis uh, -vis DG Move, DG Budget, whatever, to get... Uh, subsidies in order to develop new systems, to, to decarbonize, etc., or the infrastructure that you need. What is it that you push forward uh, as the, the, the important, uh, as the value of, uh, of, the, of the maritime and its actual contribution to, uh, to the world economy? Um, first of all, um uh, I think that, uh, as uh, it was said before, um, in, in, in the maritime um, economy, we are not very good at aggregating uh, our, our numbers together uh, because it's uh, very, s there's a lot of stakeholders, different stakeholders in, in the maritime economy, uh, multitude, it's, it's, and I think aviation in this respect is much better at aggregating numbers than, than we can do in, in, in maritime. Um, plus the fact that I would tend to consider that maritime economy and, and the way we look at it now uh, is, is more aggregated with what I call the land uh, supply chain economy because at CMECGM what we consider is that maritime is uh, uh, one of the big pillars of creating an efficient supply chain and the way we look at it is looking more as a global logistic system, world logistic system involving uh, digitalization which has become a very important part of that. So um, in terms of uh, putting together numbers, uh, I think that if we were to go down this line we would consider looking at a global logistic infrastructures uh, of transportation including uh, this pillar of maritime transportation, but looking at the global logistics supply chain as a, as a whole. Yeah, uh, just one word. 
I agree with you for the, the last part of, of what you said. Uh, that's why we like uh, at the French maritime cluster and also at the level of the European network of maritime clusters where uh, I can tell you we are not that bad, Christine, in uh, gathering figures, but we take this is only because we make a b very big precaution. Um, you are a part, I mean, the global carrier like you are is very difficult to evaluate. So we ask you your figures. We take part of it because we have decided, sir, and this is, we never count the indirect or induced jobs because you can say anything. Mm. That's why we take the direct jobs, just at least for our figures to be believable, to be credible. That's our choice. And I would entirely recommend, I would really sincerely recommend you to go on to the French maritime cluster side, where you have the spread of all maritime fi figures per sector, per, uh, and they are feasible, with the exception, with the precaution of what you said at the end. But they are existing and they are reliable. Stefan, you wanted to say something? No? No, sorry. No question. No, no. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, Anatole Fournier from the Specialized Master um, International Project Management. Thank you very much for our presentation. Um, it's a question aligned with what has just been asked, uh, as Mr. Oxton uh, said, uh, with the congestion of the harbor port and the fact that ships can uh, carry up to 10,000 containers. Uh, has the size of, of uh, ships, or oh, sorry, more <laughs> of ships can uh, has reached the limit? And if so, would it go in favor of smaller ships and harbor? And so what about uh, selling boats? Thank you. Ah, that's a very good question. Huh? Um, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. I think that what we are seeing today uh, with uh, the uh, disruption we are, we, we are witnessing and what was said by Emile about the uh, what it means for a port to have not one, but five, six, 23,000 TU container ships operating at the same time in a port, and what it means for the land infrastructures, what it means for the, um, uh, capaci the, mod the capacity of the various modalities, rail, barge, to absorb uh, these this, this huge numbers, uh, plus the fact that um, the infrastructure capacity in Europe, but also in US, and most, most surprisingly also in Asia, seems today to have reached a sort of uh, peak uh, of, of uh, capacity to absorb. Um, I think that uh, we need to go uh, in the future with the bigger agility of uh, still having big ships because we need to have the economies of scale, but maybe that uh, there will be more um, orders to come in the region of between uh, 15K to 20, 23K. Uh, uh, I think that uh, agility and adaptability to the new world trade economy, possibly combined with a little bit of uh, slowly growing regionalization should indicate that maybe um, the size of ships has reached, for the time being, a, a, a big limit. Uh, but again, uh, what will happen in the next 20 years, nobody knows. I mean, we are in the, in the process of a big change in terms of new energies, new approach to, to, to carbon efficiency, to uh, overall emission efficiency. So. What will be uh, the uh, ideal best ship in the next 20 years is very hard for me to say. It's up to you yeah. now, the young generation, to, uh, to think about it and brainstorm on what will need to, will need to be done in the, in the next 20 years. Uh, but certainly for the time being, what we see today is that infrastructures are definitely reaching worldwide a sort of uh, saturation of capacity. I would highly recommend you to go on to the site of the French Institut Francais de la Mer where we made a report which is already maybe six, seven years ago about the giant vessels, the pros and cons and all the problems. And it was a very serious one with auditing a lot of people. Technically, we, you could have, if I remember well, up till a 600 meters long vessel, which today it's about 400 vessels. 
uh, technically. This being said, when you are just uh, below one of these vessels, you know, maybe uh, very fortunately uh, the limitations which are coming only from the infrastructure, but which, which, as you said, from the ports, the limitation of the size of the ship is not coming from the techniques or from the capacity of having those ships, but only for infrastructures. And the conclusion at that time, and I think it is still valid, that due to the complexity of all the challenges which would have to be, I, I'm just quoting, I'm not an expert, but I, uh, I was coordinating the report and I remember the conclusion, is raising so, so many, many, many complex problems that it will not be before long that you can go significantly over 25,000 containers. This being said, we have been <laughs> continuously and regularly denied in, in our predictions, but uh, today it does not seem likely. That's what I can say, which is more or less confirming what you said. Any other question? Okay. Ah, one last one, one last question, and maybe, uh, Stefan, I will ask you to conclude, because you were the one waiting the longest time <laughs> and speaking the least. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, good evening. Thank you for your intervention. Uh, great of information and insights from uh, different parts of the sea trade. And I have, so it's kind of a double question. So, the first one is about sustainability. So, we have talked now about the ships, and uh, what about the dismantling of ships in terms of uh, queen conception? Because Every ships, I've worked a bit on LNG ships, have a lifetime of around 20, 30 years. And so what about the trade ship, use at say MSGM or the one you can see in the port of Rotterdam? How do you see this on the more sustainability approach? Well, I think, well, it's, we don't own any vessels, so we don't, we don't uh, take that decision. I, I um, uh, yes, I think that's the answer. Uh, I, I uh, worked for uh, a ship, Dutch shipping line, Netloid Lines, and that became Anglo-Dutch P&O Netloid. And uh, uh, by the way, when I joined P&O Netloid in 1996, we just ordered 6,000 TU vessels, and those were big vessels, and we wouldn't go beyond 10,000 TU. So there you go. But um, already at that time we had, um, because first of all the, the, the vessels, they were dismantled on the beaches of India, Bangladesh, and actually we were, we were looking at that and there were, there were uh, pictures taken and then you, see, you saw people uh, uh, breaking asbestos with their hands and what have you. So when, then we decided already at that time that we would dismantle our vessels in China in, in an environmental friendly way. So that, that's already uh, some time ago. And I think that, uh, uh, especially with uh, the, the container lines, whose vessels are so modern and who, whose vessels are uh, relatively uh, uh, clean, that uh, I think they are the front runners in uh, uh, making sure that dismantling those vessels will be done in an environmental friendly way, I'm sure. The, the dis dismantling of vessel is a very good and uh, it, it's a very good question and it's a very um, difficult problem to solve. Uh, we have seen things uh, on the beaches of Bangladesh or India which we don't want to see happening. Uh, so there are two ways of looking at that. Is a CMA CGM, first of all, we regularly audit uh, the shipyards or the, the places where we when we have to dismantle ships and we have to do that. And certainly in the years to come, we will have to go for stricter and stricter rules in uh, the um, processes of dismantling ships because uh, uh, the situation that we have seen uh, in the past years in Bangladesh or India are, are, are not, are not um, cannot, this, this cannot continue. At the same time, you need also to have the means to make sure that you can um, help and educate by continue to uh, uh, audit uh, these places uh, so that they can also progress under the pressure of international um, uh, shipping lines or stakeholders uh, like we are. So yes, this needs uh, stricter regulation at CMACGM. We, we, we are seriously uh, um, uh, scrutinizing uh, what we do with that. 
uh, and I suppose that the regulations and the way we look at it will become stricter and stricter in the, in, in the years to come, indeed. May I add one word? I agree with you, but uh, I used to be a ship owner, and then afterwards I had to take care of more general interests. And, uh, you know, there are two things which are important. Uh, dismantling ships is a job with very small added value, which means that it is not realistic to do it here except for specialized vessels, state vessels, small uh, vessels. So we are left with uh, yards which are in the developed countries. And we should not forget that in Along, in India, in Bangladesh, hundreds of thousands of people directly or indirectly live from dismantling people. So it's easy to say, we don't want to do there anymore. So with what has been decided, which has been is a very wise decision, is the promotion, the reduction, the signature, and now uh, it's on the process uh, of a convention and a code on top of the conversion, a specific code from Europe, going to these vessels, uh, to these yards like you do, giving their labels after training in Europe or training there, and, and then you will be able, as an owner, not to do the job yourself, but to you one day to go in the yard, which will be in India or in Bangladesh, but, but which will have the European label or the international label when the convention is ratified. And that's, I think this is a fair solution. Because doing it here is not realistic. And telling to these people you are not allowed to it anymore is not a, a solution either. So this is the way that we are paving uh, today. It's not. That's why you are right to scrutinize yourself. It's not working now, but I think it is a fair objective, and it's on the way. But it's, it's a, a process. process to, yeah. to implement. Yeah. Now, I think we are at the end. Uh, I would like to thank very much uh, uh, Christine, not only because she's a lady, which is not that usual in our maritime fields, uh, but because of what uh, how interesting she was. <coughs> Thank you very, very much as well. You take uh, the pain and time to to come here. <laughs> so you are just a man, like me, okay. But you were a very, very uh, good speaker. Not only for these people, but uh, all the many, many ones, uh, because it was very well spread uh, with the network uh, speaking uh, about that issue. Our organizers and hosts, of course, uh, and the Académie de Marine, uh, who is part uh, of this uh, show. <laughs> and now, as I said, Stefan, which was maybe uh, not a good surprise for you, but you, you are the ones to conclude. So uh, please uh, um, go ahead. And thank uh, you. Th thank you, Francis. And, and all my apologies uh, uh, to, to be in Rouen uh, tonight. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, as a short conclusion, because we are late and it's very late in, in the evening, uh, uh, you have seen that we face a lot of issues in the industry, in the port. And perhaps the, um, the first one, the huge one we have to face is decarbonization. Decarbonization for industry in land and decarbonization for, for the ships and the vessel. And um, I think what we have to do in, in, the, um, in the next years will be to be sure that we will manage this decarbonization because we are in a climate change. We, we, have to face the climate change, and if we if we do nothing, we will face a, a, a very very bad situation for all the countries because we we will not be able to to keep the development in all the countries in not in the European countries but also in the world. So for me and and perhaps for all the ports in Europe, uh, decarbonization is, is the huge and the main uh, topic for the next years. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And now I just say, tell the students, come and join the maritime field. You will see it's a fascinating and a world of passionate people. And if it has to be uh, improved, which is the case, then come and join and help us to improve it. Thank you very much. Bye.